Good? Everyone can hear me? Wow, what a fantastic talk. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> I am so thrilled to be here at the Rachel Carson Center and so very grateful to have this opportunity to present my work to you. I'm going to talk a little bit about the book project I'm attempting, A Global Environmental History of the First World War. And as part of that, I'm looking at energy exchange, which is why we have a little energy geopolitics there. I'll give a, a little brief overview for a few minutes, and then after that, we'll have a discussion and see where things go. So probably when people think about doing an environmental history of the First World War, the first thing that might come to mind is thinking about battlefields and, of course, the impact on battlefields. So here's a few scenes. This one, of course, is probably a familiar picture of the Western Front. We would find similar images. Whoopsies, I'm so fast with this. Similar images like there in Mesopotamia, British soldiers dealing with the sand and the heat. Or uh, here, here we go, in Africa, dealing with the environment there. Or the challenges of fighting in the Alps. Now, armies did indeed alter ecosystems on every fighting front, but in many ways, these changes uh, represented what had begun in the previous century. So the, the question that I've been considering is, was what happened during the First World War, was the war's onslaught against nature so different from what industrialization had done in the years leading up to 1914? So if we go back to these battlefields, here we see changes changes taking place in Mesopotamia to manage the water and deal with the spring floods or what's happening in the Alps uh, with the industrialization of the heights. Here we see some telephone wires. So this then brings to my mind the question of, of what exactly is a war landscape. So here we see this famous painting by Paul Nash and then an image uh, from timber operations in Western Canada. So what is a war landscape and what's the difference between a war landscape and a peace landscape? Now, while battlegrounds certainly suffered from the storms of steel, like we see here, uh, the resulting distortions to nature were relatively short-lived. So if you were to go there today, you'd probably see scenes like this. Or here, the famous Menin Road, and here what we see today. Notice we can still see battle shells there. Farmers, of course, are, are still digging those up every year. I've found that longer-term environmental changes are taking place behind the lines. Military historians typically study armies as social entities, but as environmental historians, we can think of them as biological entities as well that depended on a military ecology of energy extraction, production, and distribution. So to keep soldiers in action, to keep engines moving, belligerent countries commandeered energy resources from around the world. So I'll hop, skip, and jump around the globe to give us a few examples to illustrate those points. In 1914, coal was the principal source of industrial energy. In the attempt to offset major shortages of coal, governments typically rationed it or otherwise encouraged citizens to conserve it. This is an image that comes out of Great Britain, uh, suggesting to people how they can best conserve coal when heating their homes. In the United States, we find uh, the suggestion that don't burn coal, burn wood instead. There's so many forests out there, just chop them down and burn those. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. We find here this connection that the need for timber reserves uh, taxed forests around the world. And as a result, deforestation accelerated during the war, but in an uneven fashion. Great Britain faced an acute timber crisis and had cut down nearly half of their productive forests. Uh, there was then the attempt to uh, export timber, mostly coming out of Canada. So then incentives in Western Canada in particular to increase timber extraction. 
or we see the creation of these so-called land armies bringing civilians in to harvest materials like we see here. This is the Women's Land Army from Great Britain. This also raises some questions about gender identity and the environment and who uh, belongs in what space and how we identify places as either male or female. The opening of the Panama Canal in 1914 lowered costs of imports, especially from the Pacific Coast. So there we see a transitioning happening both in Canada and the United States, a massive expansion of the lumber industry along the Pacific Coast. That's what we see here. And along with that came the industrialization of timber extraction. German and French timber stands fared better, mostly because of long-standing institutionalized forestry practices, and a lot of their manpower was diverted to the army anyway. And the Germans were pulling most of their wood out of Eastern Europe. Recognizing the importance of actually having a forestry policy, we find that after the war, both Great Britain and the United States uh, proposed laws for forestry management. We had generals who were returning to, the, to home after being on the front lines and seeing this sort of clear-cut landscapes, which reminded them an awful lot of battlefields on the Western Front. And it was the Army that helped push through conservation legislation in order to create sustainable forestry practices. The progression of the war, however, accentuated the importance of petroleum. And at the time of the war, it was Mexico and the United States that supplied more than 80% of the world's petroleum. Uh, if you don't know, drilling for crude in Veracruz there along the Gulf Coast is a messy business. Companies would remove mangroves, they'd flatten sand dunes, and they would drain swamps across thousands of acres. And they would dig these deep pits uh, to hold the petroleum once they pulled it out of the ground that in many ways mimicked uh, the shelled landscapes that we saw on the Western Front. Veracruz in particular uh, contained oil coming out of there, contained unusually high levels of hydrogen sulfides and had exceedingly high temperatures, so it was like a blast coming out of there that would scald landscapes. This dependency on foreign oil, a phrase that we've heard kicked around a lot lately and for the past 15, 20 years, but for the British, this was a British concern, this dependency on foreign oil. And what it did was drive British ambitions in Mesopotamia during the war. One of the reasons the British were so keen on sending troops, mostly Indian troops, to Mesopotamia was to control oil fields in the provinces of Mosul, Baghdad, and Basra. I'll turn our attention to South America. South America often goes overlooked uh, during the First World War. It's neglected typically in First World War scholarship. But Latin American countries nourished and fueled European armies throughout the duration of the conflict. So for example, if we take Argentina. Argentina had a food-rich economy that made it one of the 10 wealthiest countries on the eve of the war. And this drove environmental change on the vast, fertile, and sparsely populated Pampas. Now, South America's relationship with the, with the global north is often portrayed in a negative light as part of Great Britain's so-called informal empire, which is to say that South African economies, like Argentina, were wholly dependent on European whims. But if we place Argentina in a larger transatlantic energy exchange, China challenges this view. From an energy perspective, Great Britain was equally dependent on Argentina. Great Britain's getting most of its meat out of Argentina uh, for foodstuffs, just as Argentina was dependent on Great Britain for British coal. And what we find, as the war progressed, the British thinking that they could get cheaper meat prices because Argentina was so dependent on the coal, Argentina instead decided to get its coal from the United States and then raise those meat prices for Great Britain. What this shows us is that transatlantic energy exchanges created these mutually dependent networks that the war directed, reinforced, sometimes balanced. The crucial energy reserve during the war was food. Food security was a defining feature of the conflict. And we see all these attempts by belligerent countries to mobilize food, 
Massive public propaganda campaigns. This one, right? This German potato, right? We'll hold out. We'll mobilize the last potato, even though we're surrounded by a ring of enemies. I don't know. Every time I look at this, I see a face, slightly smirking potato. <laughs> And these countries blockaded by the British and the French navies uh, faced alarming energy deficits which required authoritarian regulations like we find happening in Germany during the war in Austria and in the Ottoman Empire attempts to ration food. What we find though is that regulations were often pretty ineffective in the face of disaster. If I turn our attention to Syria in 1915, there we find a locust plague that was described as biblical proportions. That exhausted famine that was already happening there. So if we take a look at this picture, like this nice healthy olive tree, and then the locusts come through, and this is what we're looking at. We know how bad it was because they didn't even have enough olive oil to light the temples in Jerusalem. The, the redirection of food resources during the war also exacerbated the famine in Africa. In Africa, most of the fighting was taking place here in German East Africa, what's today predominantly Tanzania. Energy reserves in Africa were African bodies. Both sides carried out their campaigns on the backs of Africans. Millions were mobilized across the continent. The British, in fact, viewed their African recruits as a tactical advantage, thinking that here are people who, are, who have been raised in this environment, of course they'll give us an, as an, an advantage. But what we find on a closer look is that death rates were far higher among African recruits uh, during the course of the war than they were, for example, British soldiers. One explanation of this is African recruits, uh, often conscripted, are not getting nearly enough the same uh, amount of food as British soldiers are. But there's also changes to disease ecology, ecologies that are happening here because of the war. The main reason for using African recruits, say, instead of horses or oxen or mules, is because most of those animals would fall victim to the tsetse fly, which was the predominant vector for sleeping sickness. They would use people instead. But they're bringing in people from across the continent whose whatever local resistance they've developed to local pathogens proved somewhat ineffective when they're taken to foreign lands. So what we find here during the Great War in Africa is population displacement also meant ecological dislocation. Belligerent countries as part of this uh, food mobilization campaign often encouraged home gardening. Here's an image from the War Garden Commission out of the United States. I think this is just such a trippy, bizarro image because you have these cute little vegetables, onions, tomatoes, pumpkins, potatoes, charging over the lines as if they're in war. And you see that farmer behind them who is holding that utensil, that hoe, as if it were a rifle. So there's this militarization imagery that we have seen here. They didn't institute uh, the same sort of regulations in the United States as they did say in Germany or in Austria. Instead the head food administrator was another thing. The war created these new agencies like the food administration. The head food administrator, Herbert Hoover, encouraged citizens to eat less, don't eat so much. And they would have these slogans with food will win the war. And they would encourage people to participate in meatless Mondays or Wheatless Wednesdays. They liked alliteration. It worked. It actually worked. Um, there was, we find during the course of the war in the United States, there was a 15% reduction in domestic food consumption. And there were all kinds of activities that people could participate in. So, for example, if you're a school kid, why play during recess when you can plant beans instead, like we see here? Just because you live in the city, it doesn't mean that you can't have a garden. So here we see this idea of planting in the city, something Roger Chickering talked about in one of his books about the re-ruralization of the metropolis. Again, the military motifs are pretty strong here. Will you have a part in victory? Every garden, a munitions plant. 
just as there were attempts to change uh, production patterns, there were also attempts to change consumption habits like we saw, like the meatless Mondays, the wheatless Wednesdays. Uh, there were attempts to get people to dry their food more, to eat more dry food. There were all kinds of pamphlets advertising this. You would see images such as this in the pamphlet. Look at that, an inviting dish of dried carrots. It's pretty, yeah, it looks horrible. It's probably no surprise, right, that they kept reissuing these pamphlets because no one was eating this stuff. <laughs> but even, even despite that, what we find is that as this war expanded patterns of exploitation, it also set standards of conservation. And that's something worth keeping in mind. That being said, the economic incentives for expanding large cultivations were abundant. So for example, in the United States, the US government guaranteed wheat prices of over $2 a bushel during the war. That's high, it's really high. Uh, and what we find then is that adequate rainfall, soaring wheat prices, uh, and a bountiful harvest created bonanza farms on the prairies where optimistic farmers would take out second mortgages on their farm so they could break sod on marginal lands and reap those profits. Most of this was done across those wide grasslands in the United States and Canada, which were especially suited for gas-driven tractors, plows, combines. Wheat farming was so lucrative uh, that the financial profits outweighed the environmental costs. But as we're going to see, the ecological and economic consequences of that distorted agricultural production were pretty severe. Within a few years, Europe's agricultural yields approached their pre-war levels much faster than people had anticipated. What that meant is that in the United States in the early 1920s, grain prices plummeted by over 50%. So if you were an indebted farmer who took out a second mortgage on your farm, you likely lost it. A combination of drought, evaporation of European demand, created uh, a situation that left hundreds of thousands destitute. It also created just those right opportunities for the Dust Bowls that we see happening in the 1920s and the 1930s. The last place I'll take you to is Cuba. No one thinks about Cuba during the First World War, but in fact, there it is. Uh, it was an importer of foodstuffs, mostly from the United States. Cuba has really fertile soil, but what they're doing is mostly growing sugar and tobacco. These were the mainstays of the Cuban economy. What we find are these massive sugar plantations there in Cuba called Centrals, Sugar Centrals. Uh, the majority of them are owned by U.S. companies, like this one is Hershey's Chocolate. The Cuban government would approach these sugar centrals, uh, attempt to convince them to let their tenant farmers, the colonos, to grow food crops on the land, and to some degree that worked. But we find that because of the falling European sugar beet production, sugar cane production uh, in Cuba became far more lucrative. Uh, in 1917 into 1918, impoverished peasants expressed their resentments of the rich by attacking these large sugar centrals. In response, the United States deployed the U.S. Marines to calm the Cuban countryside, ostensibly to root out any German agents, but really to protect the sugar harvest. I'm going to introduce you to Kurt Levin. He was a German psychologist. He was also an artillery officer during the First World War. And while he was recovering from his wounds, he wrote a book about war landscapes. And he made the proposition that soldiers see landscapes differently. Peace landscapes, whereas they appear round and boundless, they extend out as far as the eye can see. War landscapes were directed, they were contained, they were bordered by violence and destruction. But from an environmental perspective, the borders between war landscapes and peace landscapes overlap or they vanish entirely. This is an image from oil extraction in Mexico. Crossing these landscapes created unease in other less obvious ways. The war simultaneously opened and closed frontiers. Some of these efforts were linked to empire building agendas. Some were part of capitalistic schemes. All of them extended state or corporate control over the natural world in some way. And so what we find from an ecological 
perspective of the war, that subjugated environments often meant marginalized people alienated from the land. Maybe that's the Great War's global legacy. Thank you very much. <laughs>